seven, snail art. Snail art needs defining. I don't mean the seemingly random silvery paths left by snails before the rain washes them away, or the patterns created on glass when the teeth have scraped away adherent algae. Both are beautiful in their own way. I mean something man-made, where the inspiration is the snail itself, and I include in this category items of jewelry, paintings and illustrations involving snails, shell decoration, sculpture, and even buildings and architectural features. Some of the earliest examples of personal adornment involve snail shells. The wear marks on shells of the sea snail Nasarius crausianus found in Bulombo's cave in South Africa indicate they were strung on a necklace. This early example of a string of beads dates back some 75,000 years, and there are even earlier examples of perforated shells held in museums that indicate early man's ability to understand and appreciate the beauty of these natural objects. Chris Henshelwood, director of the Blombos Cave Project, says this about snail jewelry. The shells provide powerful evidence of modern thought and the earliest storage of information outside the human brain. The wearing of a necklace indicates sim symbolically organized behavior, suggesting that the people who made them 75,000 years ago were able to communicate using a detailed and precise language. Once symbolically mediated behavior was adopted by our ancestors, it meant communication strategies rapidly shifted, leading to the transmission of individual and widely shared cultural values, traits that typify our own behavior. Just about every culture in the world has made use of snail shells for artistic purposes. Mention was made earlier of the extensive use of quarries for self-adornment. The shells of other small marine snails were fashioned into crowns by the Solomon Islanders and in North America, the Native Americans used, ex used shells extensively as decoration. Likewise, they were used in the Minoan civilization for decorating floors, rooms, and drinking vessels, and independently by the Aztecs and Mayans. In Borneo, small mud snails were sewn onto skirts, while in the Philippines, sections of cone shells were threaded on sashes and worn by men on special occasions. Larger, heavier shells like the turbans, tabo marmoratas, were polished and carved in to enhance the beauty of fashioned into utilitarian objects like spoons. The shells of these larger marine snails were also sought by goldsmiths and during the 16th century were fashioned into exotic vessels such as drinking cups. Turban shells were also popular because they could be polished to expose their mother-of-pearl linings. In the 18th century, Italian carvers, notably those in Naples, began using shells to make brooches. Quarries and snails of the family Cassidae 
otherwise known as helmet shells, proved easy to carve and made interesting cameos, popular in Victorian times. Cameo brooches of the period commonly featured the profile of a lady's head, while many a Victorian home had Victorian home while many a home many a Victorian home had displayed on a mantelpiece a tiger cory with the Lord's Prayer carved on its surface. Today glass blowers continue to produce items based on the snail and its shells, sometimes emphasizing color sometimes the spiral configuration of the shell and occasionally the distinctive horns of the animal. Representations of snails appear in mosaics as far back as Roman times. The floor in the basilica at Aquileia, for example, shows a basket containing snails. Their significance is unclear, though snails, as hibernating animals, were important symbolically, representing death and re resurrection. Another mosaic, forming part of the apse of the Basilica of San Clement in Rome, features a snail pursu pursued by a bird. Snails appear occasionally as marginal illustrations in medieval texts like the Macclesfield Psalter, but to see more carefully executed representations of snails, we have to wait until the 16th century and refer to books primarily devoted to the flower illustrations. One example is the Mira Calligraphiae Monumenta model book of calligraphy of Emperor Rudolf II who held court in Prague. Here the snails illustrated are recognizably of the genus Separea, Sepaya, Dutch allegorical paintings often feature the shells of exotic sea snails, an example of being Harman Steenwick's allegory of the vanities of human life, now in the National Gallery in London. Still life paintings of the 17th century often include snails too, but not always as their centerpiece but as an integral part of a still life composition. If you visit the collection of 17th century Dutch flower paintings at Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, you will see life-size paintings of snails crawling amongst the flowers and fruit. Again, if you walk into the Trey's Cant's room at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, your attention is immediately drawn to a canvas featuring John Trey's Cant the Younger and his friend Zythepsa of Lambeth, whose collection of exotic seashells features prominently in the picture. For sheer numbers of snail shells, however, Jan van Kessel's 17th century painting, Still Life of Shells and Flowers, is without equal. Among the hundreds of marine shells on display, just a few snail bodies can be seen protruding from their shells. In each case, they are of the land variety. 
printing and illustrating books about snails, particularly their shells, was an expensive business. Despite this, in the course of 18th century, many were produced in England and on the continent. Peter Dance, in a survey of illustrated conchological books, mentions several. One by German engraver Franz Regenfass. Called Coix de Coquilages, was produced with the financial assistance of the Dutch royal family and appeared in 1758, the year Linnaeus brought out his Systema Naturae. Like Seba's illustrations of shells in the pages of his massive thesaurus. The exotic specimen in Regenfass's book were arranged as if on display in a cabinet. The same concern for tasteful arrangement is evident in a book of shells based on the collection of Empress Maria Theresa of Austria, Testacia Musei Caesare. Vindobonensis, housed in the Natural History Museum in Vienna. Mention has been made in an earlier chapter of the carefully executed shell, illustra shell illustrations in Linster's His Historia Conciliolum in Great Britain. Another Englishman, George Humphrey, caused Emmanuel Mendes da Costa to produce a book of hand-colored shell engravings called Elements of Conchology. What is unusual about this work is that it was completed in prison after da Costa had walked off with the funds of the Royal Society where he had held office. It was not uncommon for the engraved images of snail shells to be shown with their spirals reversed. Such is the case in Rembrandt's etching of Comus, Conus Marmorius, woodblock printing, engraving on metal plates and lithography produces a mirror image of the object to be illustrated. This means the engraver has to reverse what he puts on the metal plate to produce an image of the snail with its spiral correctly displayed. Curiously, in the case of snail shells, this wasn't done. Was it simply that the illustrator believed that reversal didn't matter or was it perhaps a conventional convention adopted by engravers at that time? It is a problem that ex exercised Stefan Lee Gould in an essay, Left Snails and Right Minds, and one that produced a considerable response from his readers. Unfortunately, no firm conclusion has ever been reached, though convention is behind the European tradition of displaying shells with the apex pointing down so that they resemble spinning tops. As more and more species of marine and land snails were discovered worldwide, the number of illustrations increased proportionately. A copy of The Universal Conchologist by Thomas Martin, for example, had 160 plates of shells distributed between four folio volumes. Smaller, less exotic species of snail, many 
from fresh water also began to appear in books, often drawn in exacting detail like beautiful miniature on the page. While capturing the snail on the page, using its shell as a form of decoration was gaining ground in Europe. Shells of all sorts, like those that covered the walls of Wundelkammermilln in Renaissance times, was sought to adorn the walls of grottos. Ear shells, conches, top shells, indeed any suitable convoluted of colored snail shell, both univalve and bivalve, were used along with spa, corals, and quartz as decoration, and it was in England in particular that the passion for shell grottos established itself. The oldest surviving grotto in England was built by Isaac de Caus around 1630 for Lucy Harrington, Countess of Bedford at Woburn. It forms part of the ground floor of the house and consists of a vaulted hall open on one side. The grotto room has a fountain and figurative mosaics made chiefly from ear shells with their inner knocker exposed. Another grotto of comparable age exists in Skipton Castle in Yorkshire.